Welcome everyone. Uh, Ted, good to see you again. Uh, we've got a, a, a good company to look at today and uh, actually it was one that I wanted us to look at because uh, it's connected to a, a previous uh, company that we analyzed that's become very popular in our podcast, which is Kazoo. And this company we're looking at is a competitor of Kazoo's called Cinch, and they're quite new to the market. Um, so Cinch essentially, uh, they, they're very similar to Kazoo in terms of the business model and the market they're in. Uh, you know, they are involved in helping people buy used cars online you know, as they say, they take the faff, which is the problem. It's, it's, it's uh, English talk for, you know, slang for taking the problems and the headache and the hassle out of buying cars online, uh, you know, 14 day money back guarantees similar to Kazoo's. So very similar model. Um, now, this company is actually owned by another business called Constellation Automotive Limited. Now, if you're, if you're in, the, in the UK, doesn't mean anything, but uh, they also own another company called WeBuyAnyCar.com. And if you're in the UK, you have probably uh, heard and seen those adverts everywhere. So very interesting. They own uh, Cinch. Um, now, Cinch uh, incorporated in August 2018. They didn't start trading until October of 2020. And already they have um, been given over one billion pounds worth of investment from private equities or the private market. So very interesting company to look at. So this wasn't a recommendation. This was actually a, a, a rec well, personal recommendation of mine that we look into this. Uh, so Ted, um, let's, let's look at the finances. You know, what, have, what have we uncovered? What have you, uh, what have you seen there? Excellent. Okay, well, good to see you, Moeed. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, yeah, very interesting introduction. So, you're absolutely right. Um, here, here is Cinch Cars. So, let's pull up the accounts. Um, uh, publicly available on Companies House. And uh, if we just whiz down to the profit and loss account nice and quickly, uh, what we see is a company which really is not trading. So, revenue, $96,000. Cost of sales, 380,000. Ad admin expenses, 14.6 million pounds. There's a loss for the year, 15 million pounds. We scratch our heads and think, mm, what's going on here? Um, and if we look at the balance sheet, uh, we can see on the balance sheet, there is a, um, a deficit, a shareholders deficit of 15 million pounds. Um, so they've got, I don't know, they've got a little bit, well, they haven't really got any cash at all. They've got a thousand pounds worth of cash and they owe uh, 21 uh, uh, million pounds. So um, you kind of think, oh, hold on a sec, what's going on here? But actually you remember, and as you mentioned, um, this is part of a group. So we shouldn't really be looking at the individual company. We should be looking at the group companies. So whenever I see something like this, I'm always interested in who owns it. And if we go to the ultimate controlling company, here we see the ultimate controlling company is TDR Capital LLP. That's Limited Liability Partnership. This is effectively a private equity company. So they are investing in companies such as this one. However, as you mentioned, uh, they are actually owned by this company called BBD Parent Co. Okay, so BBD Parent Co, which is actually now called Constellation, is the uh, the kind of the 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 company that consolidates the accounts. So what we're doing is we're not going to look at Cinch. We are going to look at um, uh, we're going to look at Constellation. So here is the Constellation set of accounts. Let me just pull those onto the screen, uh, and you'll see that it's actually it's called BBD Parent Co. Um, but they've since renamed. And just a couple of things to kind of reiterate. Um, so this company background, effectively, this company was set up as a vehicle to allow TDR Capital to actually buy uh, various bits and pieces. OK, so you know, they call it bid co or parent co it's a kind of that's a way of keeping it quiet it's a kind of you know makes it kind of sound sexy um and then they rename it uh, uh, subsequently now what have they done we then look at the acquisition of bca so to say that this company was set up recently is not quite true because actually they bought the bcam group 
uh, and the BCAM group was a constituent of a FTSE 250 with shares on the London Stock Exchange, and they bought it for 1.9 billion. So in effect, they've taken uh, uh, BCA, which is a leading operator in the automotive industry. So that they haven't set something up from scratch. What they've done is they set up a company from scratch. They've loaded that company with cash and then gone out and bought some existing players. Um, and a little bit about BCA. Um, so down here, it talks a little bit about BCA. Uh, it, it's quite interesting. It says it uh, 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 provides post-factory automated value chain, which is basically another word for the second-hand car market. It kind of sounds a little bit sexier, though. Uh, and really what they're doing is that they're taking second-hand cars, turning them into kind of, you know, good, proper, you know, well, good mechanical cars, and then sell them to you. Um, and as you mentioned, they own WeBuyAnyCar.com. So that, for example, that's where they get their cars from. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of adverts, as you said. And, and part of the WeBuyAnyCar.com is we're not going to pay you top dollar for your car, but we take the hassle out of selling your car. So we'll probably pay a little bit below market price, but you don't have to put it on adverts and, and, and deal with kind of negotiating and all that kind of stuff. So what they're doing is that they've got a kind of WeBuyAnyCar.com, which is where they get their vehicles. They then put them through their factories and kind of, you know, repair the tears, check the engines, you know, make sure that they're all mechanically sound, and then they sell them on cinch effectively and, and part of cinch is also providing the finance to help you actually buy the car so that kind of gives you a sort of a better feel for their business model and, and, and how they um, work it and then there's a lot of information here and um, which i'm not going to go through which uh, you can read if you want again this is available on company's house um, very easy to find um, uh, and uh, you can read through their kind of business model and, and what they um, are up to but what we want to do is to go and look at the income statement um, and the income statement is here. So here we see the income statement. It's not for the full year. Um, it's for nearly a year. So it's June to March or whatever that is. Um, revenue, 1.5 billion pounds. OK, so revenue, 1.5 billion pounds. That's from the sale of um, a sale of vehicles. Now, don't forget, these guys are massive a um, uh, 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 second-hand car market already anyway. So they're selling, uh, they're already doing this and Cinch is really just another route to market for them. So the revenue, 1.6 billion, the cost of sales, the cost of the cars that they sell, uh, 1.3 billion. They're making 200 million profit. Uh, then you've got the cost of running the business, which is another 493 million. So that's going to be things like rent, rate, light, heat, um, all of the salespeople, marketing, all those kind of, you know, all the logistics. Um, they've got some finance costs, which means that they've got some debt sitting on there, um, uh, paying a little bit of tax. And you can see they're running at a loss. OK, so right now running at a loss. Mm. Is that a problem? I don't know. Um, it's, you know, it's early days for this kind of this new group, this new kind of venture. So maybe they're still bedding down, but, you know, you certainly don't get to, you know, that kind of sales uh, from a standing start. So, you know, they've bought mature with trading companies uh, and what they need to do is then to kind of, you know, work out how they can take them to market. What I think this is very interesting, though, is that this is kind of where Kazoo, who we were looking at early, is going. So when we looked at Kazoo, it was making a lot of losses. It was doing a lot of advertising. But you can start to see here. So this number here is 86 percent of revenue, which means that they're making a 14 percent uh, gross margin on the sale of the cars. And that's basically saying that they're buying the car. Um, for 14% less than they're actually selling it for. And I think that sounds a reasonable margin, you know, that kind of, and, and then they've got that 14% to, to, to work with. So Kazoo, which we've heard, which is a, a planning to reverse into a SPAC, uh, it, it, it's operating in a competitive market. It's operating in a relatively low margin um, uh, environment. The operating loss um, is then 20%. It's a negative 20%. So, um, you know, even if you're looking at Kazoo, uh, we need to think about, you know, they need to make sure that these operating costs are lower. Let me just clear these. Uh, 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 so the operating costs really need to be lower than the trading profit that they're making. And that's, you know, that's obvious, um, but it's worth spelling out. This is a really competitive market. 
Um, there's very, very tight margins up the top. Uh, they've really got to hammer down their costs and start to sort of generate, um, you know, and, and these are competitive. Cinch is a competitive kazoo. So kazoo can't just go into the market and charge whatever it wants and make lots and lots of money. It's going to have to fight for every penny, every car that it sells. It's going to have to fight tooth and nail. So it's a competitive market. These guys are making a loss. Let's go and look at the balance sheet and see how they are performing on the balance sheet. Oh, just out of interest, there's a little extra note here um, talking about EBITDA. Um, uh, EBITDA uh, is, is, is really a kind of a way of looking at what we call controllable profit. Um, I can't control the interest I pay, the tax I pay, the depreciation, the amortization. Uh, and uh, there's a little note here that says we're EBITDA positive. If anybody says I'm EBITDA positive, it usually means that they are bottom line negative. There they are making the loss. Um, so kind of the underlying business is profitable, but you know, they still need to make sure that they are actually um, uh, 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 delivering. And you'll notice here that there's been a big hit um, from COVID um, and we don't expect to see that going forward. Let's go to the balance sheet. Um, balance sheet, nothing really very special. Um, the, the, the key one here is looking at the non-current um, assets, um, the fixed assets and the biggest number easily. They've got quite a lot of property, plant and equipment in there um, and what we call right of use assets which is, you know, if you if you if you buy a if you buy a photocopier, it goes in here. I don't know why I'm saying photocopier. I'm showing my age. And if you rent a photocopier, it goes in here. It's just a new accounting standard. We don't have to worry too much about that. But what we do see is a, a lot of intangible assets. Note 19, and we'd expect that that will be goodwill. Okay, so this is a company. It's bought lots of existing companies. It will have paid more than their net asset value, and therefore. Um, uh, there's a lot of goodwill um, uh, sitting in this company. We can confirm that by looking at note 19. We probably should go and look at note 19 because it is a big number. So here is note 19 um, and the, uh, we see the biggest, uh, the biggest number in their intangible assets is goodwill. There it is. So that's the actual goodwill on the acquisition of business combinations as we talked about. Quite interesting though is some of the other um, uh, items, the in tangible assets and remember an intangible asset is something you can't touch so if this company goes bust you can't take the goodwill and stick it on ebay and sell it like you can for example plant machinery and equipment or buildings okay so it makes me a little bit nervous so a lot of goodwill there customer relationships okay that's an interesting one so you know i'm not sure how we valued those customer relationships they've got a whole lot of brands on there maybe that's going to include brands such as cinch or other brands that they market under software okay i can understand that but if it's only fit for purpose for these guys and this will be the investment in the cinch software I really, i'd expect um you know is it something which you can sell on to somebody else so you know if you're looking at a breakup value you kind of think you know, if you put all of that on um, on eBay, you'd be lucky to get 50 quid for it. Um, that's a slightly flippant comment. But the point is there is that it, this isn't like a telco who has a license like a, a 4G license that has value and somebody else will buy that if the telco goes bust, for example. OK, so you might be looking at the value of these intangibles and just saying that's not really um, uh, anything, you know, it, it, it doesn't really have, you know, proper value, if that makes sense. And there's some questionable numbers um, in there as well. So let's go back to the balance sheet. Um, we've got the non-current assets. So the inventories, those are all the secondhand cars. So 94 million pounds worth of secondhand cars sitting on forecourts. These guys are buying things like uh, air, disused uh, runways and just lining the cars up. They've got some trade and other receivables. Don't forget, people are buying their cars on credit. These guys are funding that. So there's £406 million worth of uh, uh, credit that they're owed. And then you can start to question of, you know, well, what happens if people can't, can't repay that credit, if they fall foul? Um, you know, maybe the, the, obviously the cars will get repossessed. Um, but, you know, th that means that they just have to then sell them. And they've got a reasonable amount of cash. So these guys have been stuffed up with a lot of cash um, in order to survive. In terms of the liabilities, um, let me just uh, pull this down a little bit so we can see the current liabilities. So always nice to look at the current liabilities compared with the uh, current assets. Um, current liabilities, so the liquidity ratio, not really an issue. And actually, when we look at the current liabilities, these three numbers 
this is all financing of the business. OK, so, for example, here you've got part of the financing. So this is um, a TD, whatever it was called, um, the capital, the owner. Not only have they invested equity, they've also lent money and, and they're unlikely to then say to this company, if you don't repay me, I'm going to put you into liquidation. OK, so um, you kind of look at partner finance borrowings as just another way of financing the business. They've got some bank overdrafts and some bank borrowings and they're probably going to look to refinance those. So these numbers here in red are not going to be paid out of the 748. OK, that is not going to happen. They're going to refinance, which means that we're just looking at trade and other payables. Trade and other payables compared with these numbers up here. Liquidity does not appear to be an issue for them. Uh, and then we've got the rest of the bank borrowings up here. This lease liabilities, um, this relates to the um, uh, to the, uh, the the right of use asset. So this is kind of uh, I gave you the example of the photocopier that we've got a uh, you know that we're leasing. It appears now in my non-current assets and it appears in my liabilities. Um, so this bank borrowings, we can kind of stick that together um, uh, with um, this number here. Uh, so this is effectively this is a bit like the current portion of your overdraft of your mortgage. So if you've got a mortgage, most of the mortgage is sitting up here, but there's going to be bits that you have to pay next year, uh, next month and the year, month after and the month after that, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so this is, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it, there's a lot of debt there. That's how these guys that's how these guys work. That's how they roll. Um, uh, but, the you know, they still got a positive balance sheet. Um, they'll have covenants around that debt. So the, the banks who've lent the money, they'll be used to these guys. They'll understand the business plan. They'll understand the kind of the future cash flows. Um, they can see that there is, you know, there's a positive um, balance sheet. Um, we can see that, you know, this is the investment in the business. Um, and then there's a retained loss going forward, which is, you know, which we saw uh, in the P&L account, if you remember, when we were looking at the P&L account. So, you know, all in all, when we look at the balance sheet, it doesn't look too bad. Um, what we are, I think, interested in is the cash flow. Um, and the cash flow here is their cash flow statement. So the net cash flow from operating activities, this is a key number down here, 11.6 million. Now, it's not a very big number, but it's a positive number. So that's a really important aspect. You'll notice that there's the there's the, um, the, 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 the write down in goodwill due to COVID. So they kind of, you know, they set this whole thing up, you know, kind of almost before COVID, they were before Kazoo uh, and they had to take a hit. Um, there's depreciation coming in here. It's a pretty small number, but obviously that's a non-cash item as well. So they, you know, underlying, uh, underlying they are making a profit. Uh, they are generating cash, not a huge amount of cash, but as long as they're cash positive, they're not necessarily going to have to go back to the uh, investors and raise more equity. And that will keep the banks, the lenders reasonably happy as long as they can service um, that debt. Um, Here's the invest, investment. So uh, there's a big amount of investment going on, but that was the acquisition of the subsidiary. So that was kind of, you know, that, that was setting up this company. So it's going to be much more interesting to look at this kind of in a year's time to see how they're getting on. And then in terms of the, um, uh, you know, how they were funded, it was really by, you know, shares and debt. So debt and equity together. Interestingly enough, that's almost 50-50. So, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, some of the companies that we've seen um, in the past, like Manchester United, a little bit of equity and tons and tons of debt. These guys are very much more kind of a 50-50 um, uh, kind of balance there. Um, and there's a little bit of debt uh, refinancing going on during the year already. So effectively, there's a kind of, you know, 50-50 debt, um, uh, plus a, a little bit of refinancing going on, looks fine to me. And I think that's really the kind of, you know, the, the key aspects um, uh, in terms of, of the business. So there's, there's nothing really, uh, you know, that, that jumps out or nothing really to report um, uh, from that perspective. There's, you know, there's not a huge amount of information um, uh, about the organization beyond what we've um, actually been looking at. Here's our changes in equity. Um, you know, it just says that they're not paying any dividends, but of course you wouldn't expect them to be paying any dividends. Um, that's that's really it, I think. So there's um, and obviously there's no there's no share price to talk about because it's not publicly traded. Um, so it'll be interesting to kind of look at. I think to look go back and look at Kazoo, look at those numbers, and think about you know where does that company end up? I think what's really interesting is the margins that Cinch or rather Constellation are operating at because those are the margins that we would expect Kazoo to be operating at and those are tight, 
tight margins. Very, very big top line. Real, real, really struggle. That they will really struggle though to put anything meaningful on the bottom line. Yeah, so that that's really interesting to look at. And I have a question to ask. But before I ask that question to all our viewers, don't forget like, share, subscribe. If you have any uh, companies that you would like us to analyze that you're interested in, whether you're doing business with them or whether you're thinking about investing in them, do leave a note in the comment section. Um, we've been doing a ton of those in the last few months. So you will get your company analyzed. So here's my question, Ted. Um, should we be worried about the fact that Cinch is, uh, Cinch is in a deficit number? Um, should we be worried about that? Or, or, or is there a bigger picture that, we, that would keep us kind of calm? Okay, so that's, that's a good question. So let, let me just pull up a cinch just to sort of um, uh, highlight what you're, the question you're actually asking. So here is, here is the cinch balance sheet, if you remember. Uh, and what you're asking, Moeed, is this number here, this negative 15 million, should we be nervous about it? And the answer is kind of yes and no. Um, and the reason I say yes and no is that if you think of it from a no point of view, Cinch, the company, is part of this group of companies. So it's part of the family that we were looking at, which was the Constellation Group, effectively. And what you're not going to find is that one of, you know, that they're, you know, they're not going to kind of, you know, nobody's going to sort of, you know, set them adrift because they're not performing, for example, which is why we tend to look at consolidated financial statements rather than the individual companies. However, having said that, Cinch is a limited company, is a limited liability. And so there is nothing to stop a company then just casting it adrift and saying, look, you know, um, it's not working for me. We'll just let it go. So a good example of that might be, for example, uh, Virgin Cosmetics or Virgin Cola. OK, so Richard Branson, very successful entrepreneur here in the UK, but not everything he does turns to gold. You know, he, he, he makes mistakes like anybody else and he's quite happy to make mistakes, which is kind of what makes him um, successful, uh, uh, conversely. And so, you know, there are times when a company, a, you know, a group of companies will look at part of the company and say, this isn't working for us. We don't need it anymore. We're protected by this limited liability. Uh, uh, we are protected to the extent of our investment, okay? And you'll see their investment is a thousand pounds. So they could just say, look, actually, we don't want this company. We're just going to let it go. In which case, all of these people who are owed money are going to get zero. So if you are engaging, if you're in a contract, for example, with Cinch Cars Limited, uh, and you are signing the contract, what you would want to get in place is a is a guarantee from the head office uh, from the uh, Constellation Group that says, if Cinch Cars cannot pay your invoice, we will pay it instead. It's a personal guarantee. It's a little bit, I guess the best equivalent is um, maybe you walking into the bank, uh, asking for a mortgage. They say, not a chance. And so you have to get your parents in order to guarantee that mortgage. You, they provide the guarantee. It's an off balance sheet finance. Uh, finance. It's a form of, uh, it's called a commitment. Um, or a contingent liability. And it's a way that lots of people get mortgages today. The bank won't lend to them without the bank of mum and dad acting as a guarantee. Exactly the same way here. We'd want to get Constellation to act as the guarantor for any dealings I'm going to be doing with Cinch Cars. OK, so that's a that's an interesting point you, um, you raise uh, and something to be well aware of if you are trading with this company. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because you know, all the work that I do with salespeople, for example, or even entrepreneurs that have set up amazing businesses, very important that you look at the balance sheet under that creditor section to see, you know, it's no point winning a contract with someone then you spend all that time, money and effort delivering on that contract if they cannot pay you, if there's a risk that they cannot pay you. So this is very important to look at. So I'm glad that you highlighted that, Ted. So, um, Love to get your thoughts on this. Now, uh, two videos that I really recommend, well, we really recommend that you look at. We've mentioned them a few times, Kazoo. So we've got a video on Kazoo, which you can click on up here. Um, have a look at that business, compare them with Cinch, see what trends you're looking at and you're observing. The second video is that we've talked about a few technical elements here, and it's worth looking at a video that uh, Ted and I did, which is, 
uh, you know, how to read financial statements. What are the critical elements to look for? How do you translate that? What does that mean in the real world? So have a look at those two videos. They will be of great use uh, in relation to this particular company that we looked at. So if you have any comments or if there are any experts in this industry, we'd love to hear your thoughts. You're probably seeing things that we don't because we're not experts in this industry. And don't forget, this is just the financial analysis, right? The fundamental analysis. We haven't looked at all the other areas that you should look at to form part of your investment thesis. So do look at those things before you make any form of investment decision about a company like this. Um, so like, share, subscribe. Again, Ted, thank you. This was a great video and we'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now. Good to see you, Moe.